and I really appreciate that that work that they do. What else? I would love to see those comics, by the way. If you put that person's name or social media handle in the in the chat, that would be cool. When trying to implement their work in policy, absolutely. So Audrey Barker Plotkin is on this call with me and um, we're from Harvard Forest. And one of the things that we do all the time at Harvard Forest is communicate with policymakers um, who work at state agencies or who are elected officials and who are trying to make decisions about land. Um, and we try to help them make better decisions. Um, and we try to ask the questions that they are interested in. So yeah, there's definitely like a two-way exchange always. Thanks, Zoe. Another way that I have communicated as a researcher um, is with students all the time. I'm communicating with students um, and also uh, at conferences. Certainly that's something that happens a lot. And also with stakeholders on websites. Yep, high school students, poster sessions. Liz is gonna talk about poster sessions later. Um, I work a lot with stakeholders. So these are people who kind of interact with or benefit from your research. So these are people who maybe live on the land in the places where we are doing research. So we work a lot with the indigenous community around here, the Nipmuc people whose land we occupy. And I personally am really committed to making sure that that's really a two-way exchange and that this land that we occupy, the questions that we're asking are relevant to them and respect them. Um, okay, so some good examples there, talking to fellow students about your research, yes. All communication is based in human connection. So we're gonna talk a lot about how science communication, yes, you're trying to get a specific message across, but you also are really just trying to connect with another human being. Um, and the way that we approach each communication will be different. Obviously, if I'm talking to an elected official who really ran on a platform of green energy, that's gonna be a different conversation maybe than the conversation that I have with my uncle <laughs> who doesn't believe in climate change. <laughs> so these are all, important conversations and we approach them differently. Um, so some key things to consider before communicating are who is your audience and what is your goal or purpose? So I'm, if we take the for instance of, um, we can do a few different for instances. Say you're going to a conference and you're gonna be presenting your research and you're really excited to present your research, but there's all these other times when you're gonna be interacting with people, you're gonna interact with people during meals, you're gonna interact with them in the hotel. Um, so what are, you always have to remember, like, what is your goal of this communication? Often we say, well, this is just to inform someone, but hopefully we have like a larger purpose beyond that. We want to sort of activate something in them that's going to change their behavior or change their attitudes. So here's the anatomy of a communications effort. We have the spokespeople, that's us. We have key messages that we wanna get across. We have this translation storytelling process. And then we have the audience. And there's a bunch that I could say about this. One is this translation storytelling piece. I have been trying to gather skills pretty much my whole life to make myself a better storyteller. That can mean creative writing workshops. That can mean learning sign language. Here's a person using sign language to communicate. That can mean learning other languages. Um, these are all really important skill sets to becoming a better communicator. Um, for the purposes of this talk, we're gonna be just speaking in English and uh, speaking with sound. Um, but I just want you to remember that there are many, many ways that you can communicate. We talked about artists a second ago, plenty of media that you can use and, and build your skill sets with science communication and it's all valuable and it all reaches audience. So here are your target audiences. There, you should never, think of them as sort of the general public. It's a phrase that I never use because the general public is made up of many, many individual people who have their individual experiences, maybe some shared experiences, but very rarely do you have a large group of people that have the same experience. And remember that when you're communicating with somebody, yes, you have your messages, but you also want to kind of activate them to do something, probably. Maybe you're speaking to a funder and you want them to fund your research. Maybe you're speaking to someone who, you know, doesn't do a certain pro-environmental behavior that you would like to see them do. Maybe they want, you want them to vote in a certain way. Like there are all kinds of things that we hope, um, hope people will do after we communicate with them. So who is your audience? Let's think about audience for a second. One question that I always ask myself, especially now that I've started working more closely with indigenous communities is what is their relationship to the land or to the thing that I'm studying? 
um, and we're going to listen to um, a person speak later, just a little video clip that hopefully will get you to wrap your head around that a little bit more, and maybe you can share your own experiences there. What level of interest do they have in what you're talking about? What are their needs and what do they value? So yes, you can sort of think about what they know and, and get really specific about the information, but you're also speaking to them as a human and you're trying to connect with them as a human. So there are a few things that um, we should be considering when we do this work is we're going to have us listen to a couple of snapshots of people speaking. Just give me a second and I'll switch over to this. And if you could just pop into the chat whether this is working for you. So first we're going to hear from Danielle Hill, who's Mashpee Wampanoag, which is a federally recognized tribe here in Massachusetts um, on what is now called Cape Cod. And we're going to hear from her and just hear about her relationship to the land and think about how this might impact how you are talking to Danielle about research that you might be doing in her homeland. The more that you ingest food that has been grown in your soil um, and in the waters that are around you, the more you become the place that you are living. So for example, you know, I'm Ashby Wampanoag. And I introduce myself by saying I'm Mashby. I don't say I'm from Mashby or, or I live in Mashby. Like I'm Mashby because I literally eat and ingest Mashby. Like the minerals that are in the earth, like the, the whatever is in the water that our fish are eating, I'm eating too. Like I, so that helps us and Native people really become our sense of place. And that's how we've always identified ourselves. Um, so if the waters are polluted, then I'm polluted. Like, like I can't separate myself from my environment. That's why it's really important for us to continue to be stewards of our land. And Okay, so um, I don't know if people want to unmute or if you want to just put in the chat. If you're speaking to Danielle about something that you're studying, in the land, in her ancestral homeland. What's maybe going on in your mind about how you can connect to her, how can you, how you can respect her, what she might be wondering about what you're saying. Does anything come to mind for you guys? This is a tough question. Definitely a lot in common, feeling very place-based. Yeah, sometimes people have grown up in a place for generations, and even if they're not literally indigenous to that area, they may have a long connection to it. I'm very attached to the Salt River Valley. Yeah, yep. All my project and research contribute to the health of the environment and to understand your environment. Yeah, so kind of bringing an assumption that we share a value of wanting to protect a place and contribute to its health. April, you had your hand up. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I wanted to respond. Um, I think if I were talking about, say, findings about the soil in this person's area, um, those might have a more direct impact on what this person is thinking I'm saying about themselves and not just the soil it sounds like someone from this culture is more aware of being directly connected to the land than perhaps someone from the culture that i'm used to living in yeah that's a really great point april and science for science's sake and science for our own curiosity to answer questions is something that has been really interesting to work with the native people of this area and to sort of dialogue about that because you know when you're doing work on the land and you're you're working with species who are considered their brothers and sisters like it's very personal and sometimes it can feel like you're overstepping if you're doing that work so learning how to understand how to not only approach the science communication respectfully but actually approach the work respectfully it's all sort of part of a whole um, it's not something we can really answer here exactly how to do it, but I, I just want it to be in your mind that there are different levels of depth to the way that people are going to hear what you're saying. Um, and it's really important to approach that respectfully. So here's another perspective. Carolyn Finney is a professor at Middlebury College. She's awesome. 
So let's listen to her for a second. About race, about the history of this country. Remember, all this land was stolen. All this land was stolen, right? Right, we enslaved a whole group of people to build the economic backbone of this country. None of that stuff has gone away. None of it has gone away. And just because we're talking about the environment, the parks, the mountains, the rivers, and I love all that, I'm in it, I'm there, I'm ready, climate, all of it. But if we haven't actually dealt with everything that we've done to large swaths of people for the last 400 years, you cannot tell me that we can have a conversation about sustainability, about any piece of land, unless we've dealt with our relationships with each other. Those things have to happen. It's not one or the other. It's both. But well, we have to do that work. We have to get real. We can't get to Kumbaya without dealing with the stuff. I have to be polite. And the last thing I want to say about this is that it's not about comfort. Right? This is not about comfort and being comfortable. There are so many of us who have never been comfortable. If I had the time, I have multiple stories I could tell you that are my own about what it means to not be comfortable. Many of you in this room know what that feels like. A couple of years ago, Svetlana Lazievich won the Nobel Prize for her work on Chernobyl. She's from Belarus. And I heard that she was talking to Michelle Martin, and Michelle Martin said, you know, you made a lot of your own people uncomfortable. Because it's like she exposed the dirty laundry. She told some truths about her people. And you know some of her people were not happy about that at all. And she basically said to Michelle, she said, I'm not interested in my people being comfortable. I love my people. But I want my people to be better. I almost want to stop there. I'll say two more things. Because I got time. Albert Einstein, who is a very smart dude, said, <laughs> you can't solve a problem with the same consciousness that created it. You can't solve a problem with the same consciousness that created it. Again, you can't get to Kumbaya without doing the hard work. But I like how Moms Mabley, who is an African-American old vaudevillian comedian, how she said it better. If you always do what you always did, you always get what you always got. Thank you. Okay, so how does that make you think about maybe what you would be talking about, maybe what you would be talking about, how it serves other people? Um, is there anything that kind of comes to mind for you or have you encountered this when you're talking about your research with other people, kind of thinking about how it actually impacts communities and whether there's like a history of colonialism and, you know, harm that's been a part of whatever sort of scientific tradition has brought you up. I don't, I don't know if you were expecting this from your science communication workshop today, but this is what you're going to get always with me. So yeah. Yeah. What makes this necessary? What makes it relevant in service of the people around you? Definitely. I was raised by immigrants um, who never probably dreamed that I would go to Harvard and be doing science and there's, they were so proud of me and yet still are like, wait, now what are you, why are you studying spiders? Like that seems not very useful. So yeah, you gotta, you gotta be able to really articulate like what, what is the utility of what you're doing and who does it serve? Any other thoughts before we move on and have you guys maybe practice a little bit? All right. So the last thing on this slide is just the US House of Representatives. So I find it very interesting as an exercise to look up your representative from where you're from and look at their website and see what their values are. And imagine if you were having a conversation with them about your project this summer. And what would you tell them? How would you sort of work from the framework of what it is that they value, which should be like articulated by their issues on their website? Is it connected to jobs? Is it connected to, um, you know, climate? Is it connected to education? Like how, how is it connected to what they value? I find this to be a very useful exercise and it's one that I've actually had to practice when I'm communicating with actual <laughs> representatives and senators. So what do people value? So you can start with where they are when you're talking to them. And sometimes this involves asking them a question at the beginning before you just sort of launch into talking about whatever you're going to talk about. So these are just some other questions for you to consider. Savannah put these questions together. 
what life experiences do people have? Where do they like to get their information? It's really important, like just understanding you as the spokesperson, are you someone that they're going to trust or would they rather see it like on Instagram from somebody that they really love? Like, yeah. And then the last thing I'll mention just in this vein before we really pivot to elevator speeches, because it's a very practical thing that we can do. There's a research project that comes that's sort of updated every year by Yale and George Mason University called um, Global Warming Six Americas. And it started in the early 2000s. And they basically asked people along a spectrum of like alarmed to dismissive about climate change, kind of, they asked them different questions. This particular question is, what's if you could ask one question of a climate scientist, like what, what would you wanna ask and what kind of information would you want from them? And this just shows that like, depending on where they are, in terms of like their relationship to climate change. If they're alarmed, then they wanna hear about kind of actions that they can take. If they are doubtful or dismissive, they wanna hear about evidence of whatever it is you're talking about. So it's about framing the message to, to who you're speaking to. What do you want your audience to come away from this, to bring away from this experience? What would, what's sort of the activation that you're looking for? And what might you gain from this, from this conversation that you're having? Um, maybe you want them to be really, impressed by research so that they will invite you to come work in their lab like if they're another scientist um, so just always have your eye on the ball of like what you're trying to do it sounds kind of manipulative but it's how communication works um, and it's it's what we're always doing actually in the backs of our minds um, so remember communication at its core is about human connection um, so this is these are some basics that that savannah put together i wish you could hear it in her words but when you're talking about science, make sure you give it like a cinematic start. If there are characters, make sure there are characters. Ration the details, try not to get too much into the nitty gritty and then make it relatable. So we're gonna practice this a little bit. Who has put together an elevator speech before about their research? You've probably practiced this a lot um, when just your friends have asked you what you were doing at an LTR site this summer or last summer. Um, an elevator speech is basically just kind of breaking down a topic or whatever you did this summer. Um, into just 30 seconds or so. How many of you guys have, have done this before? So Beth, I see you're raising your hand and I don't know if that's because you wanna unmute or if you're just saying yes, me. Probably yes, me. Just saying yes. Okay, cool. All right, in two minutes. Yeah, that's that's good. It's the shorter, the harder, for sure. So often elevator speeches or elevator pitches, they're sometimes called, are used kind of in the marketing and business world where you're trying to pitch an idea to some funder who wants to invest in you. So that's where this little graphic came from. But when we're talking about science, you just want them to have like an aha moment and like understand what you're laying down. And maybe you want them to have some kind of behavior change or you wanna, again, like activate some sort of change some sort of something you want them to do something to friends for the most part yeah that can be a tough audience actually sometimes my friends are not the easiest people to talk about climate science with okay so we are going to practice this a little bit but first i want you to see a couple of examples of how other people have done this so um first i'm going to give you some tips about how to do this so begin where your listeners or your readers are with what we've talked about, think about their values, think about what they know, think about what they care about, think about how much they trust you or not. Um, and then you basically wanna answer the what, where, who, when, why, and how in whatever order makes sense to you and whatever order tells the best story. Cause remember this is about story. And they're really interested people, we as humans are interested in your personal take. What surprised you most? Why is this research, research important to you personally? What did you enjoy most about the work? Maybe they're less interested in the findings and more just interested in like you climbed a mountain and it was hard and like really interesting. I don't know, what, what did you enjoy most about it? Or who benefits from the work? This is really, really important to a lot of communities. Um, and make sure that if there's jargon, which is basically just like a, like a really science-y word that other people don't know the definition of, like make sure you're not just speaking in jargon you got to bring people along with you um don't use acronyms don't use abbreviations so i want us to be able to listen to just let's see two of these um there is a show called the secret life of scientists and engineers online acronyms get me every time totally and when you're saying acronyms it's even worse people are like what did she just say cameron like what does that even mean um so somebody put in the chat who who should we should listen to 
they're, they're all interesting. We're going to watch and listen, and then we're going to give feedback, even though they can't hear us. We're going to give feedback that they can't hear. Okay, should we do Alexandria then? All right, let's do it. All right, here she goes. And we'll do Judy next. I am a geology, a geologist. <laughs> Can we start that again? <laughs> I am a geologist. The study of geology is really the study of Earth and all of Earth's processes. We look to see what's in the soil, what's in the air, what are we breathing in, the interrelation between the atmospheres and the oceans, different rock types, the different layers of the Earth. It, it's about learning what composes this place that we call home. What are we standing on? I have time left, don't I? Okay, so she stayed, I'm assuming her pronouns are she, I don't actually know. Um, Alexandria stayed really kind of 10,000 feet out, like talking about the land and sort of speaking to these like big picture values of why it is important for us to understand the sand, the water, like the, the earth that we're standing on. Um, do you guys have feedback? Like, did she use jargon? Did she use words that you couldn't understand? This is much easier in person. <laughs> Because I can see nodding. I definitely want to know her relationship now. It's the land. Yeah, totally. Me too. You can read a whole article about her on the Nova website. Okay. So she stayed pretty big picture. She didn't use jargon, but we also don't really know what she does as a geologist, like sort of day to day. Like, what are the questions she's trying to answer? Um, and like, so she didn't quite get granular enough. So I would love to hear you guys. We're going to let one or two of you practice. Yeah, great, Beth, thank you. Um, we would like you to get a little more granular. Tell us what you actually did, what kinds of questions you were trying to answer, um, where specifically you were working, that kind of thing. So why don't we listen to one more of these? Um, Judy. So I work as a product designer at a company called IDEO. That means putting my left brain with the right side of my brain and putting them together. My favorite thing about it is working in teams. It's all about trying to solve the problem together, right? It's understanding the problem, trying to solve the problem, and making something real that you can actually hold. That was less. Okay, so Judy, again, stayed pretty like far back, like big, big picture. I think people, I think their question that they had to answer was sort of like, what do you do big picture rather than like, tell us about a specific project. So I think she did a really nice job of kind of explaining what she likes about it. It felt like a very, like a human being actually talking about what she does, which is really nice. Um, I'm gonna do one more. I'm an engineer who loves education and I get to work with kids and design learning environments and technologies that go into those learning environments to help kids to build stories, to do role playing and all of these different types of things so the kids can learn about their emotions, the emotions of others so that they can discuss it and so that they can learn how to work together in the future. Okay, so I feel like that one was so good um, because she was saying why she was doing it. Yeah. And she was kind of help. She had visual aids, which is like, you're not going to have that in an elevator or like at a conference, but in general, she did a really good job of walking us through kind of the kinds of questions that she asks and, and what she does. So in a typical conversation, you're going to have a little bit more than 30 seconds to describe what you want to do, but is there one brave volunteer who want, and this is the last thing we're doing and then we're going to, I'm going to send you guys off to the, to the next speaker, to Marty and Liz. Um, so is there anybody who wants to practice, a brave soul who wants to practice? And we will give you one minute and we will cheer like mad for you afterwards, like you're a rock star, if you would like to try it. And you could tell us what you studied at an LTR site. I am an introvert and would probably like, would rather crawl under a rock and die than like just do that um, on a webinar. 
But if anybody would like to do it, we are happy to listen to you and cheer for you and give you feedback. And if not, that's okay. But I'll be sharing my information at the end. And this is your time to think if you would like to do it. Um, and if you'd ever like to practice your elevator speech with me, I'm so here for it. This is one of my favorite things. Oh, do we really have a volunteer? That's so good. Gabe, Marty, can you unmute this very brave, awesome person? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Let me start my timer. Hold on. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Not only can we <laughs> unmute her, we can, or them, uh, we can promote two panelists. Whoa. And All turn right. Turn the video on if you're up for it. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna just, so good, so good. I think we have to, how do you pronounce your first name? Henesis, maybe? You can turn your camera on. Um, it says that I'm unable to turn my, okay, now it works, cool. Hello. <laughs> I think we have to get you some swag. Like I will, I'm committed to sending you some, you can either have Harvard Forest swag or- uh, You can have an LTR hat. Okay, cool. <laughs> awesome. All right. So I'm going to start the minute countdown when you start speaking. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so I've been working at Hubberbrook Experimental Forest as an RAU student for Alex Contosta and Kaylin Hicks Price. Um, we've been lo looking at soil respiration, trying to see um, the relationship and quantify um, the relationship between. Um, the roots and the soil and see how much CO2 and O2 is exactly um, coming and what the differences are. And the ways that we are doing that is through root exclusion plots and um, CO2 sensors. And I think it would be a great way to for other collaborators to use this because they are low cost CO2 sensors. And um, they also don't have water resistance, but in case they get, um, damaged, then you are easily able to purchase some new ones. Um, for the root exclusion plots, they have that relationship with a barrier where you're able to measure the um, how much CO2 is coming exactly from the roots and how much exactly is coming from the soil. Um, and we use gas wells and yeah. Um, All right. That was <laughs> Yay! Awesome. Good job. You're a hero. It's it's not easy to talk about soil science, so good for you. Um, so do we have feedback besides like wild applause? Awesome job. I also love how you included your main question and shared how you're doing it and how, and like sort of like recruiting. I like got the call to action, the activation power from your, from your talk, yep. And like kind of improving the tools. That's a, that's a really good thing. I did notice a little bit of, what some people might consider jargon. So soil respiration is actually a pretty tough, like I think most people don't know what that is. You could get away with it, I think at an ecology conference maybe, um, but other otherwise you probably want to explain it. And then even things like CO2 can be a little tough for people. So I would just define, define, define when you can. Um, okay. I'll be like the breath of the earth. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, like I, I don't think people know that the ground breathes. So just throw that metaphor at them at the beginning. And I think, that's it. They breathe just like we do, right? It, we respire and so does the ground. Um, and then Beth just asked like, why should, why should she care about it? Um, which is a good question. Like you could say, you could, I don't know, why, why do you think Alex and, and company are doing this? Um, to find out like how much, um, like different, different chemical components that are coming from the soil and then there's a lot of scientists that extract um, different things from the soil as well. So right now we're doing carbon dioxide and oxygen, but another scientist may use that um, soil for like to measure methane or um, other chemical components, try to see like what's going on in the grounds. Let's see um, where soil um, pack and um, if the roots are damaged. Um, so like it would, so respiration is like a, a, a broad spectrum, but like you can do a lot of projects with like just one um, patch of soil that you find or like a leaf. Um, so yeah. 
yeah, maybe lead with that. Maybe lead with that was, that was so super awesome. And people don't know that the soil is so interesting. So lead with that. And there's like, it's a big mystery. Like it's this big, like black mystery that we all walk on all day. Um, so yeah, great job. And it's like elevator speeches. We all have to kind of work on them to like get the order. It's mostly about the order and like how granular can you get and which words can you use? So great job. Thank you. All right. <laughs> we'll send you some swag. All right. I'm going to pass to my collaborator, Marty, now. Sorry for going a little over time. But that's no fine. worries at all. I think we can be pretty quick. Um, one more quick uh, chat poll. How many of you have participated in a poster session? Um, first, how many of you have given a poster before? So he has, okay, a couple others, April, Krista, Jill. Okay, Nicole, lots of you. All right. And how many have uh, attended a poster session? They're super common at uh, scientific meetings and uh, there is a reason for that. I have the next slide, Clarice. Um, what, what they are, what they often look like at a scientific meeting is a ton of people just milling about with poster after poster after poster, sometimes a common theme, sometimes a little uh, not so common themes. Um, there's often food, there's often alcohol at these sessions. Um, which makes them really fun and people come to them for all kinds of different reasons, uh, but it also makes them super distracting. So the poster that you develop that you think makes perfect sense in your office or on the wall at the lab when people have like five minutes to look it over and read all the pieces is really not the poster that's going to work in this environment. Um, can I have the next slide? So uh, one of the reasons, what, what kinds of reasons do people come to poster sessions? Uh, you guys want to throw some out there? They, you know, I mean, you're presenting your poster because you want people to see your work, right? Um, Maybe you're presenting your poster because you're thinking about going to grad school and you'd love to um, find out about some labs that you would be interested in. Clarice, you can just sort of start paging through the um, definitely wanting to learn about new research in in their own field or check out other fields. Oftentimes, uh, Faculty will be sort of scouting for uh, grad students or postdocs that uh, are doing fabulous work in similar fields. Um, just to meet new people, often to, to connect with old friends and colleagues. So they'll sort of, uh, they'll go to a poster session that they think is sort of in the same ballpark as what they work on. And they're sure to run into dozens of people that otherwise they'd have to email or text to find at the meeting. So there are a ton of different things happening. I think the way to think about a poster is, is as what's called a boundary object for a lot of, uh, in a lot of fields, which is just the thing that connects to groups or people. So it's it's a physical thing that you focus on and they focus on, but the real point of it is the conversation. It's not, you know, the, the thing just doesn't matter that much. Um, so, so what that means in terms of designing a poster is that the job of the poster is to catch somebody's eye, tell them enough about what it is that you're working on, that they know whether they want to talk to you or not. Uh, and Liz is going to tell you a little bit more about how to do that. 
Okay, great. So I am preparing to talk about this. I've basically just asked a lot of people what strategies they use when they go to poster sessions, what are the best experiences that they've had at poster sessions. And so really the universal advice that I've seen is that like what Marty said, your poster is just your way to get someone to come up and talk to you. And it's this visual aid to use as you're having a conversation with someone, but that it's not, its purpose isn't there just to have someone come up and read it and stand next to you as you stand there. The purpose is to start your conversation and actually get to know someone who's coming up and talking to you. And so that's the best advice I've gotten my, for myself and what I keep hearing from people is if someone walks up to your poster, if your poster catches their eye, engage them in a conversation and say, is there something, you know, would you like to hear about my research? And here's like the three coolest things that, I, that I've learned from my work. And so um, basically your job as a presenter is to kind of force yourself to be an extrovert a little bit, even if <laughs> like you're like Cl Clarice, like she said, is not feeling very extroverted at a poster session, it's the best experiences you're going to have is if you force yourself to kind of open up and, and chat with people. So um, here's just some tips uh, that I've written down here. So greeting people, leading people through your major findings. Another great piece of advice I heard was giving something for people to take away with them. So maybe you had a great conversation, but these people are having a lot of other great conversations at the poster session. So give them maybe a printout of your poster, or if you're talking about something you've developed, give them a little takeaway. And that way they know that they can follow up with you after and ask questions about that thing that they took with them. And then uh, I just got this advice or this morning was that if you can leave a poster session, having had meaningful conversations with eight people, you've won the poster session. That's what uh, Nick, our director here at K KBS said. So that's his advice to people is try to have meaningful conversations. It doesn't really matter if you even talk about your poster when they come up uh, to talk to you. It's just about uh, engaging with others. Okay. Next, sorry. Okay. So if our goal is to engage people in conversations and just draw people to your poster, how can we do better than the typical poster? So a lot of you said you had been to a poster session before or had um, given a, or given your own poster talk before. And a lot of them look like these examples that are up here. So this is actually an example from MSU where I work, um, where it's just a ton of text on a, basically a big printout of almost the same thing you'd put in a published paper. So it's just a ton of text. Someone could come up, read everything and learn every, every detail about your research, but it's not very visually appealing. Um, there's really no clear take home message from this. It's just a lot of information for somebody. So what can we do when someone has all these posters to choose from? How can we make them choose our poster instead of the one next to us? Right, next. So this, um, you guys might have heard of this concept before, but it's the better science poster. And I, I really like this model as a starting point where the goal, you just put your main take home message in huge font with the main uh, points bolded. And this is the one take home message that you would want someone to leave your poster with. And if you think about milling around, seeing 20 plus posters, really the best you can hope for is that someone is gonna take away your one key message. So this poster is kind of the extreme example in the other direction where you just put your one take home point and then all these little sidebars on the side are your, are your supporting documents if someone is asking you more detailed questions. So if they ask you a follow-up about what kind of data you have to support that big take home point, you have your graph on the side, but the main um, visual of the poster is, is the message that you want to use to draw people to you and that you want them to take away. So again, you know, think of think of your poster as just there as like a way to attract people and as a way to have resources if you need them in conversation. Okay, next. Um, and then there's a lot of uh, resources out there if you're trying to think of um, some ways to make your poster a little more visually pleasing. And so you can even just Google that's, that's what I was doing this morning was just Googling like beautiful examples of posters and nice templates to start from. So you don't have to be 
particular, particularly artistic yourself, you can start from a design that already exists out there, but just keep in mind some general visual tips to build a better poster. So try to think of something that will catch people's eye. Always try to use a visual over words if you can. And so this is a great piece of advice. And I always regret once I print out a poster, how small I made the font on my own poster. But basically you always want a font to be bigger than you think it should be. So definitely no like size 14 fonts on your posters. It should be, I think like 28 or even 40 or larger. It's much larger than you think. So always, you could also try to find a poster you really like and just copy the font sizes from that poster. That's really handy. Um, you want to summarize one to three key findings, make those really prominent on your poster, and really they could be the majority of the text that you have on the poster. Um, also try to think of um, accessibility for those who are coming to look at your poster. Since it's so visual, you can think of um, using accessible colors that will work for colorblind people. You might not want to go crazy with how many colors you use. Um, and there's a lot of example uh, color templates online too that you could copy if you're trying to, if you're stumped to think of a color combination that looks nice together, you can just Google, you know, pretty color combinations. And uh, one of the um, pieces of advice I saw was don't go too crazy with colors, try to use a dark and a light primary, one accent color, one text color, and that will really make your poster look cohesive and, and attractive. So again, if I was gonna start from scratch with a poster, I think I would go out and try to find a template of something that I thought looked really nice and caught my own eye. And then I would know that that was a good starting place. And typically in science, a lot of times people inherit posters from other people and start with that as their template. And I, I know I'm guilty of that myself. I'll present a poster one year and then when I have to do another poster, I'll just take that one and replace the information and use my same layout instead of starting from scratch. And that can perpetuate these really text heavy and these uh, types of posters that have always just existed in science. So, you know, don't be afraid to break the mold and find something that you find attractive instead of just inheriting something from someone else. Okay, next. Okay, so what if you are at a poster session and you are not uh, what if you're not the presenter, but you're milling around and you're looking for posters. Um, the advice I have would be pretty similar, where instead of walking up to a poster that looks good to you and just starting to read the text on there, try to introduce yourself to the person presenting the poster and say, you know, ask them some questions. So ask them, what is the one main exciting point that you learned from your research and what or what did you do? Uh, this summer and just just some basic like conversation starting questions. You could ask everyone the same question. It, it becomes really easy. But uh, I used to just go up and start reading and only ask a question if I thought of something as I was going through the text. And now I like it a lot more if I just go up and start chatting with the person who's standing next to the poster. Um, and then also, again, if they have something to take away, try to take something away with you or ask for information about how you could follow up with them because you might remember some really exciting piece of information from the poster session, but if you have my brain, you don't remember who you heard it from or the name of the person who you heard it from. And so don't be afraid to, you know, ask someone to give a, a business card or write their name down so you can follow up with them later. Okay. Um, and then on my own slides, there were a lot of links in there for uh, places where I got information from, and I can um, add it to this additional resources page that Marty started here. But there's a lot of um, resources about like how to make a better poster, how to summarize your research in a really quick elevator pitch. And so, um, you know, if you have your own resources that you found that you really like, feel free to share them with us too. Because I think, you know, these slides will be available to everybody and we can keep building a, a nice list of, of places to go if you're looking for inspiration. Okay, so we don't, yeah, we don't have that much time, but we're gonna do questions after this. <laughs> yeah, we have time for a few. If people have them. Oh, good, I see people putting uh, resources in the chat too, that's great. Yeah, there, there uh, Marty, I just saw your question about accessible palettes. You can just Google colorblind friendly palettes and uh, they'll give you even just like the, um, the uh, color code so you can be really precise with colors if you want to mm -hmm. 
um, you know, for some of the materials I make, I just will make sure a graph has colors that contrast with each other, even if somebody was going to print it in black and white, that even just the saturation of the color being different is enough to help people differentiate it. And sometimes you don't think about the way that someone's going to view something and then they print it out and it all looks the same color. And I, you know, I always forget that's a, a possibility. Oh yeah, yeah, checking it out and converting it to grayscale. That would be a good idea. If you're going to print out posters to hand out to people while they're, you could print out just a mini version of your own poster, print it out in black and white and see if it looks okay but as a version to pass out to people. All right. I think how to word this. Um, oh, I don't want to word my question. It's okay. um, Communications workshop is fine. <laughs> yeah, I really, yeah. I guess, yeah. Like how, how um, in settings, I feel like especially other than like your predestined location where you're going and people are expecting you to speak or like a poster presentation where like, you you want you know you want you have a segue to talk about your research like how do you um how do you go about uh connecting i guess and showing up in people's inboxes outside of that <laughs> do you mean like for example like a person whose lab you might be interested in working in and you haven't ever met them before is that what you mean or do you mean yeah stuff like that like networking and 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 what Yeah, net, networking, we could have, uh, and we probably should at some point have a whole nother webinar on, but um, in the scientific context, I think it's often looking for uh, a talk that they're presenting at or um, uh, looking for, again, a, a boundary object, kind of a point of conversation to start with. So if you're, if it's someone whose lab you think you might be interested in working in, you might contact them first about a paper that you're excited about and have questions on, um, that kind of thing. Other ideas? I think yeah, just I'll in contexts. Just I just heard the work. advice that if you're going to a conference and there's someone there who you would want to meet, especially if you're an early career scientist or an, an undergrad going to a conference, invite them to coffee and just ask if they want to meet with you while you're at the conference. You know, it might be hard to or intimidating to walk up to someone after their talk and introduce yourself. But I think someone would be really excited to know that, you know, somebody was interested in their research and wanted to meet and talk with them about it. So you know, saying, hey, your re most recent paper was really cool. I'd love to get coffee and chat about it. I think anyone would be really excited to do that. And sort of a second point on that is that I found I am not a practicing scientist right now. I'm a science communicator and, and I talk to all sorts of people whose science I know nothing about. And curiosity gets you a really long way. Um, you know, you start the conversation, but if you can keep asking those good questions, like people will sort of start to soften and unfold and let you into their whole world. Um, people love talking about themselves. People love talking about careers they've spent 30 years doing, you know, whatever they've been doing. Um, so that's a really good way. And it's a learned skill. It takes practice, but it really opens people up. I love that image, Gabe. <laughs> I have definitely, um, if you like can recognize the person, if you, happen to be in a session with them and maybe you go sit near them and you strike up a conversation and ask them what they're excited about at the conference and then you just happen to show up at that thing too and then be like I'm so glad that you recommended this it was so interesting also do you want to talk more I don't know yeah being excited and doing a little bit of homework mm -hmm. is good I have a couple of stock questions that I use at conferences I think like you know what did you what was the most interesting thing you heard or saw today, what, what's good, all of those kinds of things. Um, electronically, it's harder. 
harder than in person. I think we're still working some of that stuff out, but um, people do, they like to be asked about their work. Mm -hmm. And it's still possible. I have gotten one lab tech job, maybe at least one with a cold email to somebody mm -hmm. I didn't know. Yep. All right. Well, I think we are at time, but thank you guys so much. Hope it was helpful. Hope to be seeing some of you um, at the ASM or other places. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye, thanks.